Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on returning guest John Atak. John, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jeff. John, I wanted to get into it right away. You wrote Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky, one of the best books out there on the history of Scientology or on Hubbard. One of the central people in early Scientology is L. Ron Hubbard Jr. Yep. And he went by the name of Nibs, so we'll call him Nibs, N-I-B-S. Yep. Now, who is L. Ron Hubbard Jr.? How does he enter early Scientology? He is the oldest child of Ron Hubbard, um, born in 1934, in May 1934, um, by Aaron Hubbard's first wife, bearing in mind that Aaron Hubbard only had a first and a third wife. Of course. Um, according yeah. to his later testimony. Um, <laughs> I've had no second wife. Uh, he's called Nibs from babyhood, meaning his Nibs, which was a, a common expression in the 30s, um, for um, an eminent person, his Nibs a person who should be followed and obeyed, um, not that he ever was. He was abandoned by his father um, somewhere around 1941, um, the age of six. Uh, he had a younger sister, uh, Katie, Catherine, uh, born in 1936. Uh, they were both abandoned and um, Margaret Lee's grub, also known as Polly or um, the skipper by Hubbard, had to rely upon um, Hubbard's parents um, to provide because Hubbard failed to pay any maintenance money uh, for their upbringing. There was no contact with them um, until 1952 and somewhere around about June 1952 uh, Nibs has just had his 18th birthday. Um, he rolls up in Phoenix, Arizona and says, hey dad, here I am. And that's when his association with his father began. Uh, for seven years, Alwyn Hubbard Jr., Nibs, was the second in command of the Scientology organization. He was his father's enforcer by his own account. Um, he was a big guy. And there was a cert certain degree of intimidation was necessary because um, Hubbard Sr. was notorious for not paying his bills. Um, I think is it part of the danger formula about paying all your bills? He never got that high in terms of the ethics conditions. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> so people would come along and complain, and Nibs would beat them up. Wow, that, uh, that blunt. First, yeah, that was his first job. He was to be thoroughly discredited later on because he admitted to perjury. But the circumstances under which he admitted to perjury... Um, make that contract illegal because any contract where somebody has been threatened is not a legal contract. Nibs was threatened with his life. Uh, he was told that if he didn't sign this contract then they'd kill him. Um, and he believed it and he had enough experience of what happened at the top of Scientology to believe that it was true. His time with his father is really quite fascinating. Um, I sort of got to know Nibs remotely in 1984 because um, it, was, it was too expensive to do what we're doing for free right now and have a phone call across the Atlantic for me in 1984. It's very expensive. So I had a friend who was a phone operator and in the middle of the night here, he would ring up Nibs and ask him my next set of questions. And I must say that I, you know, by this time, I had absolutely no doubt because there is no doubt that L. Ron Hubbard Sr. was a pathological liar. Um, you'll see it often enough, it's not a matter of him contradicting official records or what anybody else says, he contradicts himself all over the place. I mean, the simplest way to show that is to say, look at the uh, biography that's given in Mission Into Time, and then listen to the uh, Introduction to Dianetics lecture of 1950. And they're almost, apart from his name, there are almost no two facts the same. So I knew that Hubbard was a liar, which as a man who had said that honesty is sanity and that Scientology was the road to truth and the road to truth must be trod with true steps, you know, I knew that Hubbard was not really a reliable witness to anything. And I must say that my impression of Nibs in the first few years was the same, that, that Nibs was not a reliable witness. And in writing 
Um, I know that Ben Corridan relied on him to some extent, though, um, and his name is on Messiah or Madman. But in fact, as I recollect, Nibs dropped out of that project after six weeks, um, basically having been given a chunk of money to stop talking um, and certain threats to back that up, no doubt. Um, so he talked a little bit to Bent and, and told him some things and, and I looked at what he'd said and, and sort of went, well, I'm not going to use any statement made by Nibs that I can't confirm from a secondary source because it strikes me that he's a fabulizer like his father. He's somebody who exaggerates. He's somebody who makes up stories for the hell of it. Um, so he cannot be trusted. With the years, I've, I've now seen more of his material. There was a, a book called One Tenth of One Percent of Scientology, which I believe Paulette Cooper helped him to work on. Um, Paulette believes that, that Nibs then went to Scientology and told them things about her, which is thoroughly possible. Uh, he was under a tremendous amount of pressure and intimidation. But late in life, in the 1980s, mid-1980s, he wrote a remarkable manuscript called The Telling of Me. Um, it's extraordinarily well written, which surprised me. Um, it's better written than anything I know by, by his father, who I think was a fairly poor writer, you know, as, as a literary um, auteur. He, he, he's not very impressive. Uh, his ideas, you know, things like fear and typewriter in the sky, slaves asleep, his ideas are very interesting. But the writing style is always kind of, I don't know, it's like he's trying to do something that he can't really do. And it, his, his voice is, is peculiar. Um, you don't really see it so much in the Scientology books because, of course, he only wrote one of the Scientology books. This is a, a little known fact. Hmm. But the only, the only book published by Scientology that Hubbard wrote is Dianetics, Modern Science of Mental Health. Um, all of the other books are actually edited either from his talks or from his notes. So, for example, Science of Survival in 1951 was written by Richard DeMille, the uh, adopted son of Cecil B. DeMille. So, so let uh, me stop it there, John. This is interesting. Hubbard kidnaps his daughter, Alexis, his, his daughter by his second wife, Sir who he, and he would later deny, absolutely deny paternity of Alexis, which, um, you know, well, if you see a photograph of her, it'd be quite surprising that, you know, <laughs> to think she wasn't related to Ron Hubbard. She had the red hair, you know. Oh, she does. Uh, and, and, and what's so strange is in this um, Scientology journals of the period, he promotes um, Alexis as the first, the world's first Dianetics baby. Yeah, and indeed the first edition of Science of Survival has a dedication to Alexis Valerie Hubbard. Uh, late traditions are dedicated to Diana Hubbard. So when he's down in Cuba... Yep, was... three months in Cuba with, with Richard DeMille, uh, who, who had to babysit because Ron was drunk all of that time. I mean, um, interviewing Barbara Cloden, who, who he'd left in L.A., when he started working on Science of Survival, she said he was drinking a bottle of whiskey a day. And DeMille told me that, that when he got to Cuba, he was drinking a bottle of rum a day. You know, so. Yes, and L. Ron Hubbard said his father could drink a fifth and it wouldn't affect him. Yeah, and pretty much every day. I mean, Jesse Prince uh, told us that um, he, he was diagnosed with alcoholism um, because of the state of his liver towards the end of his life. Chronic alcoholism. Hubbard had a, a dictation machine which recorded onto little green discs. Um, they were, what I don't know, four or five inches across. I have actually seen one of those. A, a collector called Ron Newman uh, showed me one of the original note discs for Science of Survival and played me the tape from it, you know, because you don't replay them. And Hubbard would kind of have another drink, take another, you know, phenobarbital capsule, maybe a little bit of amphetamine, those are the things he was into in, in 51, and then um, tell a story. I mean, let me, let me actually, there is a very important story which I, I don't think we got into. Um, in 1984, I interviewed a woman called Jo Scott. Jo Scott had been Hubbard's personal assistant um, at Fitzroy Square in London in 1954. And wonderful woman, she was just great. Um, it, it's one of those things about Scientology, you meet so many people who've been involved, they're just really wonderful people. And um, it makes it all worthwhile somehow. And she, I interviewed her for several hours, and then 
she said, you know, there's one thing that's always puzzled me. She said, Hubbard said to me one day, he said, um, I didn't actually write Dianetics. Um, it was dictated to me. It was automatic writing. It came from the Empress. Could you tell me what that means? Wow. And it's kind of weird to be sitting there and going, well, yeah, actually, I can tell you exactly who the Empress is and exactly what that means. So, you know, even with Dianetics and when you try and read Dianetics and, you know, it's my misfortune to have read it three times. Um, I met many Scientologists who'd never managed to finish it and just had to pretend. Um, it's incredibly turgid. Um, you've got 400 pages and, and everything that's in there could be probably expressed in 50 pages. He just goes round and round saying the same things, talking about attempted abortions and, and round and round you go. So the thought that he was using, you know, this spiritualist sort of practice of automatic writing fits in very nicely and um if and when you want to talk about the empress we can do that oh too. i want to i want to do that right now and this, oh, okay. is, this is important for new scientology watchers and maybe uh, uh people who don't know about the empress mm. can you tell g give us the background because what precedes dianetics is hubbard's occult work with jack parsons and thelema yeah so who is the, uh, who is the empress that Hubbard refers to? The Empress is, is the Empress represented in the Tarot or Tarot deck, um, specifically the character found in the Crowley version of, of the Tarot deck. Um, I'll trace that. Um, you know, Hubbard was well into Crowley, as we know. On the Philadelphia Doctorate course, there are three lectures where he talks about Alistair Crowley, calls him you know, my very good friend, Alistair Crowley. Yes. Um, but he also talks about the Fool card in the tarot deck in the lecture. And he says, this is the card where the Fool has an alligator barking at his heels. Well, as far as I'm aware, um, and I published this statement nearly 30 years ago, and nobody's questioned it yet. But as far as I'm aware, the only tarot deck or tarot deck that carries an alligator on the Fool card is the Crowley deck. Um, others have a dog. Hmm. So, so, you know, he is making a reference which makes it clear. He also talks about the Book of Thoth, which is Crowley's examination of, of the tarot. The Empress card, um, according to Crowley, if I remember rightly, and listeners will have to forgive me because it is at least 30 years since I looked at this material and I certainly don't want to look at it again. I can't stand Crowley. Um, but the book of, in the Book of Thoth, you have a description there. And as you... What... Um, Crowley was doing, it wasn't original to him, but he was collapsing the deities of different systems. So, um, you know, when I was a kid, we were told Greek myths and Roman myths, and we were told that, you know, Athena was Minerva to the Romans, and, you know, Zeus was Jupiter, and so on and so forth. So Crowley took that further and introduced, you know, the Egyptian deities and made his own not particularly profound study of these. The Empress is represented by Hubbard as the Egyptian goddess Hathor. Hmm. This would also, also in, in the Greek system, it would be Artemis, and in the Roman system, it would be Diana. Now, I want to pause on that word and think about what Dianetics might have to do with Diana, because one of the things that magicians do is that they seek to include symbolic language and gestures into what they do that their followers will not understand and every time the word dianetics is said if you were a ritual magician who worshipped diana who is hubbard's um, tutelary divinity or genius that was the old roman word for it the person who directed his activities every time somebody used the word dianetics they invoke the goddess diana on hubbard's behalf uh, i don't believe in any of this nonsense by the way so I'm not too worried about it. I would like to see how far he could push people. I learned a story through a member of Nib's family um, who might not want to be identified, who, who told me that um, Nibs had told him that one of the things that used to happen was they'd have these congresses. You know, the way they made money was not by running centers, but by every few months having a congress where you charge $500 and you'd be promised that you'd learn some fantastic brand new secret of the universe. 
Um, most of those secrets of the universe, of course, have fallen by the wayside. Much of yes. 19th century Scientology is, you know, if you try and talk to a contemporary Scientologist about finding the rock, you know, or even about GPMs now, goals, problems, masses, that, you know, which were essential practices for a while, that they've, they've gone. But the story that I was told was that time after time, and Nibs was involved for seven years, has been right next to his father throughout that. And what would happen is that his dad would say to him, let's see if we can get them to do this. Let's see how far we can go. Um, there are little instances of it which are noticeable. So, for example, in the Philadelphia Doctorate course, he tells everybody that they had many lives in Ars Lycus. Now, mm. that's not very far away from the British expression, Ars Lickers. <laughs> and so he's basically saying everybody in this room is an Ars Licker. Wow. I think, you know, and things like the R245 firing a shot through the floor, that there are all sorts of things which... You can't really tell whether they're jokes or whether it's Hubbard demeaning his followers. Um, you know, I, I mean, I come back to it again and again. In the PDC, there, there's this lecture where Hubbard talks about the making of games. Life is a game. It's just a game. That's all that's going on here. It's a game. But there are some people who make games. There are some people who play games and some people who are pieces in the games. And the games maker... And this, he, he is talking about magic here. The game's maker doesn't have to follow the rules. The player has to conceal the true rules from the pieces. Scientologists are the pieces. David Miscavige is the player. And David Miscavige really doesn't know what Hubbard was up to. Because, you know, David Miscavige, pretty soon, he, there's no more runway. The bridge didn't cross the abyss. You get as far as OT8 and then <laughs> there's the abyss. It didn't work. Because the 15 upper OT levels, named on the 1974 bridge and in the original edition of Scientology 0 0.8, and quickly withdrawn, explain that there are 15 levels beyond OT8. So Miscavige's trap is that he can't take anybody further. He's only got that, that much of a bridge, and then you're done, you're finished. Well, and so yeah. he is trying to find this material, which is why Pat Broker was followed for 24 years solid at a cost of $11 million, because he's the only person who might have those OT levels. Dead ends. Yeah. Uh, so, so you have this, um, what starts out as, a, as an occult form that goes into Freudian, psycho, uh, Freudian psychotherapy, yep. that goes into an e-meter. He's constantly innovating, trying new things, seeing what will stick. You know. Yeah, I mean, the essential part of this is hypnosis as Hubbard himself very often confessed, and we didn't notice. Um, and again, my paper, um, Never Believe a Hypnotist, which is a quotation from Science of Survival, where Hubbard says, you should never believe a hypnotist. Having elsewhere said, I started studying hypnosis at 16, and Dianetics is based upon it. So, you know, 25 years later, I was still practicing hypnosis, and you should never believe a hypnotist. So, if we move aside this terribly traumatic word, hypnosis which, you know, people really don't seem to get, and we call it instead guided imagination, you know, which is a definition accepted in the Oxford Handbook, which is the basic scientific survey of hypnosis, guided imagination. Scientology is guided imagination. Um, it's a system of behavior modification, and hopefully everybody would agree with me that it's that. You arrive, if you believe in Scientology, you believe that behavior modification is good, you know, your behavior is being modified in a way that makes you uh, an operating phaeton, which is to say, able to exist outside of a body with full perception, which is Hubbard's definition of an operating phaeton and the goal of Scientology. I've yet to meet anybody that's actually got there. Um, but nonetheless, it's a system of behavior modification based in guided imagination. And so by giving somebody a, a playing field in which to play the game and the rules of the game, the, the rules of the game are... You run round and round a pole, believing that you are getting higher and higher up a, a grade chart, up a bridge which curiously goes up. You know, it's not a bridge that goes across. You go up the bridge. And the idea is to keep you running round the pole so that you feel exhilarated, euphoric, the normal hypnotic effect, and accept 
this reality, this agreement that's being given to you, that this is how the world is. Those of us who came away from Scientology feeling cheated, lied to, and even damaged, would say it's a system of behavior modification that works negatively. Mm. But it is a system of behavior modification. Well, yeah, even at the, even at the lowest levels with TRs, you, you are learning to be controlled. Yeah, and indeed, as, as Steve, my good friend Steve Hassan has, has often said, um, training routine zero is the most overt use of hypnosis he has seen in any of the hundreds of cults that he's studied. So the lowest level, the very first step, is to place you in, into control. If you even think about the notion of doing a personality test, you're being asked 200 personal questions by people you've never met before. And your willingness to do that, it's like the way a stage hypnotist will test your suggestibility before getting you up on the stage. And your suggestibility is being tested by going, you know, will you answer 200 personal questions free of charge? We don't charge you for which we can then put into our files. Um, you know, I, yeah, I've always thought that the OCA, the Oxford Capacity Analysis, the free personality test, was a culling mechanism most fundamentally. Exactly. And uh, the people who would give the church any trouble or objections they're not interested in yeah and uh because really yeah, it, I, I found it very offensive when i was asked to do this free personality test but i did it because i was curious about self-discovery that is it was presented to me in a misleading way not that we want to control you but what do you want to discover about yourself jeff do this test yeah and then i, and, found, I found myself being very angry during the test because it was very intrusive Yes, exactly. It, it, it's an interrogation. But it does, it, it, it does find out if a person's amenable to be controlled by the group. Yeah, and then the TRs themselves. I mean, Nibs told this story to me um, about the upper, indoctrina upper indoctrination TRs, um, TRs 6, 7, 8, 9. And he said that, that they were, if, if you look at the, the bulletin, it says developed by L. Ron Hubbard. Well, the first edition of that bulletin said developed by L. Ron Hubbard, Jr. Hmm. And they kind of got rid of the junior. And Nibs said that what happened was they had some very rowdy students and people who were really not doing what they wanted them to do. And they were, you know, having fun, which is definitely not allowed. And so Hubbard Sr. said, work out some way of controlling them. And those training routines were there to get you to... Once you go, it, it, it's kind of like the ritual of magic or even the rituals of religion. that You get somebody to go through these rituals and you have their control. And it's explained within the text that what you are showing the person is that their reactive mind can be controlled. That somebody from the outside can come in and control their mind. This is, in other words, a form of mind control. You know, it's not hidden. It's not hidden at all. You're learning to have that done to you is the bit that's not obvious, which is, again, the, you know, the two-faced thing that you think, you know, you're being shown the front door, but you don't see what's coming in through the back door while you're doing this training, which is, as you say, you're becoming, I mean, at, at um, the Toronto conference, the Getting Clear conference, I, I had the great privilege of having Chris Shelton, Christian Jerko demonstrate TRs with Steve Hassan and I explaining what each step means. You know, you get somebody to, you know, step one is you're going to do OTTR zero. So giving people a misunderstood word is a way of sticking them. So we're going to start you. And when I first came to Scientology, the first thing I did was OTTR zero. So first of all, I had to look up what an operating Satan was before I can do anything else. And then I'm told to sit in a room full of strangers with my eyes closed. And to do that, you have to trust to do that you have to give trust to to that group of people because in a normal environment you'd keep your eyes open you'd be looking out so the first thing is to control somebody into their willingness to do that the next is to fixate their attention which is a way of inducing hypnotic states of hallucination you know anybody who's done tr zero has seen things you know um you, you, you know, you, you, there's no way that the brain can accept a lack of movement, so it starts to create something. It's called the Gansfeld effect in some places. So you then get 
that fixation and you then go through a series of ever more nons nonsensical practices, you know, reading out bits from Alice in Wonderland, um, you, you know, off with his head and all of this sort of stuff until eventually you get to the wonderful shouting at the ashtray. And by the time you've gone through these procedures, you are completely in the hands of, of the registrar. You know, you are, you, you've been brought on the thing where, you know, in hypnosis, there's a thing called a yes set, which is used by salespeople. If you ask somebody nine questions to which the answer is normally yes, the sky is blue today, yes. There are no clouds in the sky, yes. By the time you get to the 10th question, you are much more likely to get a yes answer. Mm. The 10th question would be, would you like to sign the check now? It, it is control and manipulation. Yeah. Now, now, L. Ron Hubbard Jr., eventually, you know, he sees this and he helps even create it. What, what leads to L. Ron Hubbard Jr. leaving? He didn't have enough money to support his children. Um, he went to his father for a pay rise and his father said no. And he left. He didn't disbelieve. He was perfectly happy doing the dreadful things he was doing. He'd, you know, that's how he'd spent, you know, from the age of 18 to the age of 25. That's what he'd done. And he was terrified of his father, who, who he believed had, you know, was the B666 and 666 and had terrible magical powers. But when he realized that his children weren't going to have enough to eat, he left. So it was that it was that prosaic. I need to make more yep. money. Yep, that's extraordinary. And but but the biggest crime you can commit against L. Ron Hubbard is to leave him. That's right. Abandonment to a vulnerable narcissist is impossible. They, they collapse under abandonment, um, and they they will then start attacking you. So Nibs leaves, and he's basically fair gamed for a long time. He, he, yes. has, he, he has to move around a lot from place to place. Yeah, and always answered the door with a gun behind his back. Really? Yep. Wow. Now, now moving ahead in time, in 1983, he gives an interview to Penthouse Magazine, which, yes. I, which I find to be so fascinating. Yep, it is. Revealing. What is your opinion of, and he, he used the name what, Ron DeWolf, in that yes. interview, but Penthouse called him Ron Hubbard Jr. John, what's your opinion of that that '83 interview? Um, I make a distinction with with all of the things that that Nib says. Wherever he is describing his own direct experience, I believe he's truthful now. Um, wherever he is saying, you know, things like, uh, you know, it was the same man who gave the magic to Hitler was the, the man who gave the magic to my father. I know that he got that story from his father. Hmm. Uh, but, I mean, looking at that, um, the interview, um, he, he, Nib says, uh, he's asked, what did you believe in? And he says, I believed in Satanism. There was no other religion in the house. Scientology and black magic. What a lot of people don't realize is that Scientology is black magic, that it is just spread out over a long time period. To perform black magic generally takes a few hours or at most a few weeks, but in Scientology, it's stretched out over a lifetime, and so you don't see it. Hmm. Now, yeah, black magic is the inner core of Scientology, and it is probably the only part of Scientology that really works. Elsewhere, he said, um, Scientology doesn't work in the way that Elrond Hubbard says it works, but in the way he intends it to work. And given that there are no OTs, there are no clears, there are no releases, I'm sorry, I've yet to find a Scientologist who, who can communicate freely to anyone on any subject because they're not allowed to talk to me. So I'm afraid they've all failed their grade zero, let alone, you know, they're not allowed verbal tech. They're not allowed to talk about their cases. Um, none of it is true. None of it has happened. People feel euphoric. They feel better. Um, you know, they feel more certain and, and the normal kind of things that happen when you hypnotize people, sadly, but they don't develop. You know, I, I actually dug out my original copy of 0 0.8 while we were talking, which has the state's attained list, which would later be changed to, you know, OT6. The state attained is OT6, as described in materials. Well, in this first edition, OT6 is the ability to operate freely as a Thetan exterior. So 
we're told that Scientology in 1974 had the tools to make real OTs. They, that level was withdrawn, of course, in 1982 and replaced by more body fate and stuff. While we're on the page here, the end phenomenon of Scientology at that time was the operating phaeton. And it says operating phaeton, which is the OT course section 8. And the description is the ability to be at cause knowingly and at will over thought, life, form, matter, energy, space and time, subjective and objective. So that's what you're meant to be getting. But, um, in, a, but in other words, uh, John, that statement you just read, that's mm -hmm. the statement of what the magician will attain. Yes. Absolutely. Exactly. It's, where, it's a confluence between, and if you look at the OTO, um, the Ordo Templi Orientis, then the eighth state is their final point, and it is what the, the eighth ceremony is what Jack Parsons and Aaron Hubbard did, which became later the Book of Babylon, which curiously, even commentators on magic didn't notice that they were just doing the last ritual. Uh, but yes, the OTO 8 is, is the state where um, do what thou will should be the whole of the law. Uh, love is the law, love under will, to, to quote Rabelais' statement as reformed by Alistair Crowley. That you come to the point where your will, you are able to dominate anybody and anything. You are able to make things come into existence out of will. It's kind of Disney magic, you know. And I... You know, this is what Hubbard was, was aiming at, and this is what he was claiming he was going to give to other people. Um, Scientology is a form of magic. Yes, absolutely. And to state magic in practical terms, it is simply Scientology is an organization that seeks to be a law unto itself and to impose its will upon the world. Yes. That, that's it in, in practical political terms. And this is why Scientology, the church is fundamentally a psychopolitical terrorist organization. That's the only way this obnoxious, spoiled, self-centered church is going to impose its will on anybody is through threats, terror, lawyers. And this is where you rip the lid off the magic, the OT, and you see it comes down to a lot of grimy, dirty, filthy people. And I mean morally. Mm. using lawyers, threats, intimidation, terrorism, stalking, spying to impose its will. Yes. And, and this is one of the things that Hubbard lied about. Fair game, the entire point of fair game, and Marty Rathbun admitted this in Louis Thoreau's My Scientology movie, yep. the point of fair game is to make a person's life a living hell until they stop what they're doing. So yep. there is and, no and magical or OT power. It's simply make their life a hell. And Hubbard called it shutter them into silence. And he also said, if possible, ruin them utterly. He certainly did. In 1955, in the Scientologist Manual on the Dissemination of Scientology, where he also talks about pretending to be a Christian so that you can talk people into buying Scientology. Um, as somebody who was shuddered into silence uh, very nearly, and fair game for 12 years, largely on Marty's watch. Um, yeah, if they'd had any magical powers, they would simply have stopped me, wouldn't they? The first OT7 I met, a fellow named Gunter, told me about the OT death stare. You know, the belief back in the, the late or the 70s that OTs could kill with a stare. Yep. And... They had sort of this Scientology voodoo that they had special powers. And in yep. fact, John, I have to say this. And what is lunatic is the whole idea that there was actual real OT levels that the U.S. government and the CIA wanted so badly that they had to kidnap or kill L. Ron Hubbard in 72, put in a body double, and that the CIA remote viewing was all the real thing. Mm. And... And, I mean, now you can read, like, Operation Stargate, uh, mm. other books saying that it, it, it didn't, you know, it had mixed results and that things like spy satellites, human intelligence were a lot better than laying in a bed and remote viewing. 
Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And we've seen people like Darren Brown who can uh, kid you and absolutely convince you that they're doing remote viewing. I mean, I did get into a, a bit of a firefight with Ingo Swan. Uh, really? Ingo Swan and Pat, yeah, Ingo Swan and Pat Price were the two Scientologists who were at the so-called Stanford Research Institute, um, along with Uri Geller, uh, when um, put off and targ, two physicists, unfortunately not qualified in psychology or magic, you know, conjury, uh, were conned by Uri Geller, by Ingo Swan and by Pat Price into believing they were doing remote viewing. Um, put off got very angry with me for naming him publicly because he was a reasonably eminent physicist working at Texas U yes. and didn't really want people to be reminded that he'd done Scientology. So he publicly said, I did very little Scientology. And I pointed out, yes, but it included OT3. You know, so, hmm. And I'd, I'd met his wife, who was actually at that, pretty much that time doing OT5 in the independent. So, you know, I didn't think that was too truthful. But there we go. It later came out that there were 13 Scientologists on that project, including Price, Putoff and Swan. Swan very angrily attacked me and um, it pointed out that I can't write, which was his, his major, major problem with me, uh, it seemed. But without actually denying, they were the original spoon vendors, hmm. as they're they called. And I wrote about that too. And then John Ronson wrote a book and made a lot of money. It's very disappointing sometimes, isn't it, doing research. And you know, it's like when Janet Reitman pilfered material from a piece of Blue Sky and had a bestseller. It, you know, and made a lot of mistakes in her text as well, I must say. It, it, it's, a, you know, it's difficult, but, but my research was always to find things out, and, and I'm no good at making money, quite obviously. Well, that's, but, that's one of the problems of, of many writers is they're very good at researching imagination. And their work becomes appropriated. Uh, but, but nevertheless, in the aggregate, your contributions are enormous. Thank you. And, and they're important. I, I do work for which I've made no money. Hmm. And it, was, it was never really the point. I anticipated that, that I'd be sued into the ground at some point, and I was. Um, surprisingly, I managed on my own and without any support from the outside to survive 12 years, um, which I, you know, sadly, it, it was extraordinarily damaging. Um, but, you know. What is, and, and that, that was their, their goal to try to ruin you utterly because you spoke out. So really, the... the but it, had they been OTs and able to use the death stare, I wouldn't have lasted 24 hours, would I? None of and us would have. If they been OTs and been able to do remote viewing, why did they need to steal rooms full of government files that they could have obviously have just sent Ingo in or, or Pat Price and they'd have told them what was in the documents. Yeah, they could have remote viewed them. One of the early OT tests was to read a book, uh, you know, on another continent <laughs> or, or cause someone to, to write you a letter. So it, this, is, yeah, yeah. this is the glaring thing about Scientology. When you get up close, it's, it's not at the high levels. They're not using any kind of OT powers. They're engaging in espionage, burglary wiretapping, break-ins. Drowning judges' dogs. Yes, and, and, and so that's really, that's really you, you see it not as an occult group, it begins to morph into what it really is, a criminal organization. Yeah, so I mean, I, very early on after leaving, sort of went, well, you know, the heart of, this, you know, I, in fact, again, I wrote a paper called Religion or Intelligence Agency to, to discuss these problems in Scientology, you know, and it is at heart a narcissist um, attempt to control the universe. You know, that Hubbard had this conceit that he was going to become, and of course you get to OT8 and that wonderful um, bulletin that, that would have to be taken off the course within the first week, where he says, hey folks, truth revealed, I'm Lucifer. <laughs> yeah, the light bearer. Now that, 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 that itself has caused some controversy. The church denies it, although you know, people who did, who did the original levels on the ship, OT8, said, no, it was there. Jesse's confirmed it. And, um, yeah, as you say, several people who did it have confirmed that, that that was on it. And Jesse was, he says, you know, Mitoff wrote it. He, he took bits and pieces from Hubbard's writing and stitched them together from, you know, because, of course, he was tape recorded every day of his life from about 1968 onwards. Hubbard, every, every fart and every belch was all taken down on tape and so Paul Mitoff had to 
compile this thing. And Jesse even said that one day he found Nancy Manny sitting, going through it and saying, oh, well, Ron wrote this bit and Ron wrote this bit, that she could see which bits were Hubbard because she'd seen so many thousands of Hubbard telexes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've read that document. One of the things that's freaky about it is that... Um, it's in, uh, what's his name? The guy who wrote Lonesome Squirrel, the con oh, man. Stephen Fishman. Fishman. Fishman actually talks about it in there and says, you know, Ron got me to do this. So where he got his hands on it, I do not know. But Well, what's interesting, if you want to go to a, a legitimate source, there's a book called Lucifer's Bridge, Scientology's huh? Lost Paradise by George M. Wittek, who yeah. was one of the first who, who OTAs. Did actually, who did yeah. OTAs. Yeah, and it's a tremendous book. I, I thoroughly enjoyed. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the many things. Uh, yep. For example, George shares with us that the Mormons were at flag in the 1980s, and I and going for another episode. There are so many comparisons between the legal structure of the Latter Day Saints and the Church of Scientology, and I'm convinced they have some dirty back channel arrangement. Well, let, let me uh, let me tell you a story about that. I worked for five years on um, the articles that would eventually be published in June 1990 in the Los Angeles Times um, with Bob Welkos and Joel Sapel. Excellent articles, really groundbreaking. And the reason it took five years was that the LA Times decided they weren't going to run them. When I talked with Welkos about you know how they'd eventually come out, he said it was very easy. At this time, the LA Times was in the hands of some Mormons and uh, there was a party and somebody talked about the contents of OT3 to these Mormons and they decided they were going to run this series of articles about Scientology. Well, well there, there are s certainly some things I want to talk about in future interviews with some other people th th that have some more interesting information. So one person, so L. Ron Hubbard Jr. leaves, he does his penthouse interview, which I I think people should read it, and I'm going to, to post it on the Money Project. Well, it's, up on, it's up on Arnie's site. That's where I got it from. Oh, last yes, week. that's right. It's on Lermanet. I'll post the link to Lermanet. You know, and I have to say, Arnie Lerma is such a fabulous archivist. Yeah. One of the great things Arnie did was take and scan everything and upload it on Lermanet.com. Yep. And Anonymous called it Mount Lerma because when they came out, they just it was a wealth of data mining for Anonymous. Love Arnie yep. Lerma and his work and Lermanet. And it is on Lermanet. I'll post the link there. Now, switching gears, someone huh? who's intensely fascinating, I must hear what you have to say about him, is Captain Bill Robertson. Okay. Who was he yep. in Scientology and what did he become when he left? Uh, Captain Bill was a, a biker in a biker gang in the early 60s. He was uh, about six foot four. He was a big guy. He got involved with Scientology. He became utterly dedicated to Hubbard. He was a member of the original C Project, the first 19 people who would, along with, say, Hannah Whitfield and Joe Van Staten, who would, and I think Otto was there at that time. Um, they would become the core of the C organization. He was promoted to the rank of second deputy commodore by mm. Hubbard. The, the first deputy was Mary Sue Hubbard. So um, when Hubbard was gone, when Mary Sue was gone, this was never cancelled. So Captain Bill was technically the head of Scientology. Really? Um, yeah, as technically. His de deputy commander, so he was large and in charge. Yeah, but in fact, it was, a, it was like the ranks in the Sea Org. It was completely meaningless. Um, he did all sorts of wacko things. I, I, I came to know him pretty well because he lived in East Grinstead for eight months. And... Um, I don't know, you know, we, we always got on. And it, it started out that when I left, I, I, wrote, I just wrote in, in 1980, September 83, I wrote a series of questions which would say, look, this is what policy says, why is it not being applied, basically. And of course, I, was, I, I, I had my second ethics chit in nine years. I was only twice knowledge reported in all those years. Many commendations. Um, but it, what happened was that... that it, on I think it was October the 15th this this guy called um, Bevan Priest um, managed to 
and my wife let him into the house and I was still asleep and he came up and I woke up to this man standing by the side of my bed saluting me which was a little bit weird <laughs> saying in calling me sir and saying that John Mace had gone to Australia the guy who was around whom the independent thing was beginning to form and he'd left it with Bevan to run this gig at the Crown Hotel on the 18th of October um, for Captain Bill Robertson. I'd never heard of Captain Bill. And he said, would I, would I do this? You know, because he didn't know how to do it. And I was a bit groggy. So, I, you know, if I just said no that day, my life would have been so different. And I was then appointed the um, chairman of the OT Committee UK. Now, I went quickly and looked up what that meant. <laughs> and um, didn't really understand what was going on. But I became the OT Committee UK. It was, you know, me and my body thetans. Um, there wasn't anybody else involved. And that was nominally a position under Captain Bill. So I'd just like to say that after Captain Bill died, I am the head of Scientology. <laughs> <laughs> no. So I first met, met Bill there. I think you can still find the video uh, of that incredible night, which was the first public meeting uh, criticising Scientology in the United Kingdom ever. Wow. And um, the night before, I, I talked this video cameraman out of Scientology. He came and filmed it and then gave me the tapes and went back into Scientology. So, it, you know, by strange happenstance, we have this amazing thing. Bill had been expelled. Um, Going back on, on, on what happened with him, he ran the first advanced organisation in Edinburgh, where OT3 was first delivered in 1968. And he did cruel and unusual things to people. Um, in Let's Sell These People a blue, Piece of Blue Sky, I tell the story of James Stewart, not the wonderful Hollywood actor, but the South African Scientologist who committed suicide in Edinburgh hmm. in 1968. And David Mayo was at Edinburgh and I interviewed him. Bob Kaufman, who wrote Inside Scientology, the first and original version of Inside Scientology, or How I Became a Superman, um, which is a fascinating book, and is the first place that OT3 was ever published in 1973. Kaufman published it. But he was there, and what had happened was that, that Stuart was an epileptic, he'd had a fit, and he was put into an ethics condition and told that if he had another fit, he'd be thrown out of Scientology. He'd got to control himself, you know. And um, Kaufman remembered seeing him crawling around the waiting room, picking out bits of lint from the carpet with a bandage around his head where he banged his head. Bill, very matter-of-factly, told me that one of the ethics punishments, because this was the real heavy ethics period, um, was that you had to crawl across the roof of the building. It's three stories high. And though they're slate roofs and they're pretty steep and you have to crawl across the roof and back as a punishment, you know, to scare the living daylights out of you. Yeah. Um, which Stuart was made to do, um, Bill admitted to me. So he, he ran that and he did that kind of stuff. Then he ran the um, advanced dog in Los Angeles and a, a friend of mine was on the staff there. And there'd been a kind of a funny situation. He was sent in because it was said it was being run by a couple of lesbians who are into uh, bondage and SM stuff. You know? <laughs> and that, this is one of the stories about Scientology, the incredible sexual promiscuity in the early Sea Org, for example, um, which, of course, reversed, you know, cults will either make you have sex with everyone, the kind of Raj, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh approach to destroying a person, or they will prohibit sex. And so Scientology twang from one extreme to the other. Um, but Bill was sent in to rescue this operation and he told me that um, he found the two psychiatrists who'd actually were the problem for Scientology internationally and uh, the way he dealt with it, they were both living in Los Angeles, the way he dealt with it was he rolled up to their door and threatened them that if they didn't leave town he was going to kill them and they left town. Sadly the suppression of Scientology did not end there because obviously <laughs> there were psychiatrists in other parts of the universe doing this too. But a friend of mine who was on staff there with Bill at the time said that he would they'd do their day's work, which would be like 12, 14 hours, and then they all had to go up on the roof and watch for the spaceships. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because it's been on the Internet for a long time that Captain Bill would have, have them up with binoculars looking for Mark Cabs. Yep. 
Yep. And this was Hubbard's idea that there'd be a mass Markavian landing, which he called. No, this is Bill's idea. This is Bill's idea there'd be a mass Markavian landing. Hubbard, as far as I can tell, just mentioned it a couple of times in lectures as like us, like us, just one of those things, the Markab Confederacy. Bill became totally obsessed with Markab. So, John, Captain Bill was obsessed with Markabs and he had people up on Big Blue. This is before they had the Big Blue. This is the original Aeola building. OK, so he the, and you would just look for uh, spaceships. Yes, the, the mothership. And so, you know, we wind on through the years and build it all sorts of amusing things. And then he, he ends up in East Grinstead. And uh, I start out in October 83. I'm pretty much I'm the chairman of the OT committee UK. So I am the guy. Uh, it was almost like I was a, a legitimate form of guardian's office. My <laughs> job was to defend the independence from the mother cult, um, uh, which I invested a great deal of time into. Um, and the independence got very confused because after about three months, I was kind of going, you know, Hubbard was a charlatan. He was a liar. And, you know, that didn't get me a lot of fans. No. And um, then I was sort of going, and actually, I, I don't, I think the tech is pointless. I, you know, I think, I certainly don't believe in body things, you know, by, so by January 84, I'd had my last auditing session, which confirmed my completion of um, OT5. So I, I sat down with, with the flag trained auditor and the flag trained CS in the independent, Steve Bisbee, Morag Belmain. And I said to the auditor on the first day, you know, I don't think I ever had uh, any kind of Thetan inside me, any, you know, body Thetan, whatever these things are, they're not Thetans like you and me. And so Morag blanched a little bit and had to acknowledge me. The list wasn't reading on OT5. The next day I said, um, you know, I think these things were probably um, some kind of entity or machine, if, if anything at all. And she blanched a little bit more. And then on, on the third day, and it always happens on the third day, doesn't it, in these stories? Um, on the third day, I said... I didn't have any body thetans. They aren't entities. Um, the closest I can get to it is science of survival attention units. Mm. There was something I had my attention on. I don't believe in it. And I then did something that you're never meant to do in Scientology. I, I said, I'd like a PTS rundown. I've been in Scientology nine years. I've never had a PTS rundown. I'd like one. And Steve Bisbee kind of thought about whether you allow the PC to, or pre-OT to CS for himself. And decided that he could in this instance, you know, there'd be no harm. In PTS Rundown, I was asked, you know, who is it that's being suppressive? And I, I hadn't even thought about it. it. It wasn't intentional on my part at all until I was asked the question, at which point I automatically said, Elron Hubbard. Wow. At which point, Morag Balmain completely blanched. <laughs> I've never seen any. She was white as a sheet. Yeah. You know, flag trained auditor, standard techie, and, and a lovely person, by the way. She she said, well, is there anyone else, you know, and I just I just came to her and said, you know, I could sit here and list all day if you want, but you're going to find that's what reads. And sure enough, whoever else I brought up, the only thing that read on the list was Aaron Hubbard. So this poor woman, after all of these years of dedication to Scientology and all of the horrors she'd been through, had to say, I'd like to indicate that you were PTS to L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> That was my last auditing session. It's, I've never wanted to pick up the cans since. And to realize it was a year later, because I'm a little bit slow witted. It was a year later that I sort of went, oh, how poetic. Scientology is being PTS to L. Ron Hubbard. That's all it is. You know, he is the causal agent who has control over you. You are no longer self-determined. John, that is just phenomenal. Uh, Isn't it wonderful? It is. My formulation is the EP, the in phenomena of Scientology is nothing left of a person. Yeah. But I like yours better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if you just send me your bank details, you know. <laughs> John, that is, that is just a phenomenal place to end. Yeah. Ron Hubbard Jr.'s reputation was destroyed. So yeah. my question becomes, is Marty Rathbun, the new L. Ron Hubbard Jr. I think in some ways, I mean, it's certainly fair to point out that both of them functioned as hitmen, that their job was to silence opposition to Hubbard by whatever means. I mean, Jesse Prince has been relatively public in saying 
that he would like Marty to admit where the bodies are buried. So he feels that Marty may have been guilty of some quite extreme thing. I, I have no idea about that. But they were both achieved a high rank. Marty, of course, never worked for Hubbard directly, didn't know Hubbard. And, but he was a true believer in the fullest sense. As we talk now, it's interesting to see what will happen next because you don't know. There's never been anything like this in American religion, religious history. I think I, I maybe told you the last time we spoke that one of the things Jim Beverly, my, my good friend Jim Beverly said to me, is he, Jim's written, I think, 18 books now. And he said, look, for six years I've been trying to write a book about Scientology. I'm not interested in anything else anymore. It's so fascinating. But I keep having to write another book about Islam, you know. And it, it's true. You'd think all of these years later, and after all of the th nasty things have been done to me, that I wouldn't be sitting down and relishing this conversation we're having. But it, it's just still, wow, you know. What's more, by continuing to talk about it, I learn a great deal because one of the realities is that there isn't a single source in this universe. Everybody's a source. And when I talk to people, it's like I, I wrote something at the, the bunker a few years ago. And ooh, to my shame, I can't remember the name of the guy who, who responded. But he wrote a comment saying, when I did TR0, I thought I was um, being induced into becoming a sociopath. Hmm. And I went, oh, yes, you know, for, right from the beginning right from the beginning, you're being made selfish. You're being made self-obsessed. You're being sealed off from the rest of the world. So it's like, yeah, okay, if my family dies, that's okay, you know, because I'm doing the bridge. And I've got it. So many people have told me that when their parents died, they didn't cry. And then they left psychology and it suddenly hit them, that, you know, what they'd lost. Uh, I had a friend who did bull bait and he, he did it. I knew him in 1975. And he did bull bait. He was in Scientology for 11 months. And he would had, you know, he used to get panic attacks. He used to get anxious. And after bull bait, he didn't get panic attacks. Wow. This, what a great success story. He didn't get anything. For the next 40 years, he had no feelings. Wow. 40 years. He just didn't feel anything. And he came back he came to me about six years ago and um, said, hey, remember me? I said, yeah, yeah, I really do. Oh, fantastic to hear from you. Lovely guy. Yeah. And we, we got to know each other and he immediately told me this thing. He said, you know, I, I just don't feel anymore. And, um, you know, he's worked that out now, which is fantastic and extraordinarily annoying for me because usually you can work out the damage that Scientology did to people pretty quickly. But you have to know where to, to undo it. So I see so many ex-members who've gone decades and they've still got mannerisms and characteristics that belong to Scientology. They still haven't actually managed to open the, the door. And it can almost always do it in a day, you know? Well, let's um, make that, let's, John, let's make that the subject of our next interview is how do you extricate yourself from the Scientology mindset? Cool. Yes. Yeah, that, that, and that'll go to your, the, the new work you're doing as well, which is so very interesting. Fantastic. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Well, John, thank you so much for being on the show. I always appreciate having your your yeah. incredible research. I feel like I'm, uh, you know, I have this vast archive I can talk to who's a real person. Again, we'll say this: there's nothing like watching Scientology to see what will happen next. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else like having espionage, movie stars, billions of dollars, intrigue, lies. Yeah. And yeah. and. I never cease to be amazed by it, but I will leave you with a truism that Scientology critics have. Scientology is always worse than you think. Initially, people are fascinated by it, but the deeper you go into it, the more repulsive and mm. hideous the Church of Scientology becomes. Yeah, and until in the end, it's, it's exactly that pile of feces that is being shifted from one place to another by the poor enslaved devotee, and that's all that's left. Um, well, one of the things, is Elizabeth Moss still involved with Scientology, the actress, actor, I, I should say? I don't know. Because, there, you know, there's also a great irony, you know, that the voice of Bart Simpson, Nancy Cartwright, is a Scientologist. The chef in South Park, um, Isaac, the great Isaac Hayes, was a Scientologist. And it, this thought, that, you know, um, Tom Cruise has been in movies about scams and cons like uh, Magnolia, which I think is an excellent film. Yes. Um, He's brilliant in it. But 
they, it's like they they get these scripts and if they kind of stood back from these scripts they go oh yeah elizabeth moss is has just starred in the handmaid's tale margaret atwood dystopian novel uh, where she's the lead character who is the person who is being controlled and it it's sort of the wizard of oz you know it's kind of how is this happening the the that people who are themselves um, submerged immersed in this system they can't see that what they're talking about is what's happening to them no and that's a good place to leave it they can't yeah. see what's happening to them yeah and we'll on the next show we'll talk about what is happening to them and what they can do about it because right. something yeah. to borrow Scientology's words something can be done about it yeah, and, and truth blows the lies away yeah and as Tori Crispin said a long time ago the way out is through the nearest door yes yeah I, well i said it before her and oh, okay I, I gave a talk woo, in the 1994 at Hull university and um I, I basically said the way out is marked exit and pointed <laughs> to the door. so you know um just like Aaron Hubbard, actually, I originated everything, Jeff. You know, just, <laughs> uh, okay, it's great talking with you again, Jeff. Yeah, likewise. And John Atex, thank you for being on our show. And, and to those of you listening, if you uh, want to see the work I do, it's ScientologyMoneyProject.com, where we deal uh, unravel the Church of Scientology's Money and Legal Labyrinth. John Atex, what is your website? Uh, OpenMindsFoundation.org. And uh, this is about teaching the world how to recognize predators such as Hubbard, uh, you know, in, in any situation, pedophile grooming, human slavers, uh, gang leaders, um, leaders of religious political therapy cults, and um, relationship narcissists, people, you know, who recruit somebody into simply into a relationship to control and destroy them. So we teach people about the characteristics of predators, and we teach about the seduction and recruitment techniques of these people. And then we, we teach something about healthy skepticism, how to look at the world and how to recover if you've been, you know, in an abusive or toxic situation. Um, it's all free of charge. Just, you know, go to the website. We are interested to gather donations so that we can extend the website so that we can put little free courses on it. But our work is all free. And my book about the subject is Opening Minds. The Secret World of Manipulation, Undue Influence, and Brainwashing, or words to that effect. Uh, John, it's been a pleasure having you, and yeah. thank, thank you, you for listening to everyone out there in our audience. And for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine, and as always, we'll be in very good touch.